Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Watership Down, class number six. <clears throat> As we get ready to uh, uh, to plunge into the uh, uh, second half of the book, uh, and in fact, I'm so keen to see if I can not get behind again <laughs> for the second half um, that I'm going to uh, jump in very quickly. Um, but uh, so yeah, so let's uh, let's jump straight in because I want to follow up. Um, well, let's see. First of all, let me check. Is uh, is audio coming through for people? Uh, I'm getting one or two people who are not hearing me, so I want to make sure that that's not universal, of course. Everybody else have audio? Okay. Good. Good. Um, ah, yes. Gerald Michael asks, is the title a reference to the Black Rabbit or General Woundwort? Indeed. That's the question. Uh, that's, uh, in fact, uh, 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 the confusion I was going for. Um, okay, let's see. So, yeah, Curtis, I hope your audio <laughs> comes back. If not, uh, I should have it. Um, anyway, um, so uh, uh, so let's let's carry on. Um, we're. I wanted us to, to begin by following up with where we ended off. Uh, last time, that is, before I moved on to, I finally moved on to people's questions and comments last time. And weren't those an awesome lot of questions and comments? That's why uh, I was so keen to get to them and, and kept you guys late and everything. Um, but, um, uh, so, um, let's, um, uh, let's follow up with that, with something that I, you know, I think is, is noticeable already to this point in the book, but something that really begin. Um, begins to gain steam uh, as we go along, especially at this point, um, especially in the second half of the story. Um, and what I'm referring to are sort of narrative signs of a conspiracy. Uh, Holly believed uh, and stated his faith very clearly in his uh, in his relation of the fiery messenger of Frith incident. Um, that uh, they had nothing to fear, you know, in that moment, in you know, that night he knew that, um, you know, his rabbits had nothing to fear, he and his rabbits had nothing to fear because they were between the paws of Frith, right? Um, and, uh, I, and after we pointed that out and looked at that, there were a couple things that really jumped out at me in the first few chapters here in book three. Um, here's one really small moment. Had their journey been made in years gone by, they would have found the downs far more open, with outstanding crops grazed close by sheep, and they could hardly have hoped to go far unobserved by enemies. But the sheep were long gone, and the tractors had ploughed great expanses for wheat and barley. The smell of the green standing corn was round them all day. Um, this is a really small thing, right? I mean, uh, the fact that you know, there's uh, great expanses of wheat and barley on the downs, hardly, you know, says, like, the hand of God, right? Um, uh, at least not, not, not very explicitly. Um, but this is just one example of many times when we can see this particular note being struck in the narrative, right? That, like, normally this wouldn't have worked. Um, or, you know, it might have gone either way, but as things worked out, things happened to work out really, really well so as to uh, uh, facilitate the, you know, plans and situation of, uh, you know, of the Watership Down Rabbits and this whole Watership Down Warren venture. Um, they wouldn't even, wouldn't even have, uh, um, uh, they wouldn't even have been able to, um, uh, to, to, cross this terrain without being spotted uh, by enemies. Um, here's, uh, uh, um, of course, we get a much more striking example soon thereafter. This is Hazel chiding Bigwig after the fox incident. Playing El Ajera, said Hazel. You duffer, you might have thrown your life away for nothing. We all thought you had. Don't try it again, there's a good chap. You know everything's going to depend on you. But tell me, whatever happened in the trees? Why did you cry like that if you were all right? I didn't, said Bigwig. It was very queer what happened, and bad too, I'm afraid. I was going to lose the Hamba in the trees, you see, and then come back. Well, I went into the undergrowth, and I just stopped limping and was starting to run really fast, when suddenly I found myself face to face with a bunch of rabbits. Strangers. 
They were coming toward me as if they were going out into the open comb. Of course, I didn't have time to get a good look at them, but they seemed to be big fellows. Look out! Run! I said as I dashed up to them, but all they did was try to stop me. One of them said, You stay here, or something like that, and then he got right in my way, so I knocked him down. I had to, and raced off, and the next thing I heard was this dreadful squealing. Of course, I went even faster then, and I got clear of the trees and came back to you. Um, Now, of course we learn more details later, we can already guess at this point, as Hazel is apparently guessing, that that was in fact an Everfin-wide patrol, which was moving out towards them. They were this close to being caught by an Everfin-wide patrol um, when, uh, before Bigwig led the fox onto them. Um, We learn, of course, more details later on in the last chapter of today's reading, uh, in the General Woundwort chapter, um, that the rabbit in question, the rabbit who accosted Bigwig, um, and who gets knocked over by him and subsequently killed by the fox in a tragic accident, was Captain Mallow, one of the most uh, remarkable and competent officers of the Everfin Ausla. Um, so, you know, there are a lot, there, this, this incident raises a lot of questions, right? Some questions of the variety of what would have happened had Bigwig not gone off, you know, uh, and, and drawn the fox in that direction. Um, it sounds like well, one of two things would have happened, right? Either Captain Mallow would have uh, would have approached them, right, and they would have had to fight um, that four rabbit Everfin patrol. In which case, many of them they probably would have been able to kill them all, but very many of them certainly would have um, certainly would have been killed. Um, and uh, but it's also quite possible, of course, Captain Mallow being uh, as intelligent and capable as we're told that he was, he might not in fact, have just gone up and accosted them. He might have shadowed them and and found out where they were going. He might have realized that the four of them would probably not be able to match um, this really quite large group of Hlesi on the move. Um, You know, and then again, that would have led to even more complete disaster. So, they were this close to one level of disaster or another happening to them, and the only thing that saved them is this freak accident. Right, um, you know the idea that Captain Mallow, Captain Mallow of all rabbits, got killed by a fox. I mean, that's like insulting, um, and uh, you know, and and you can tell that Woundwort um, is is sort of particularly galled. Uh, by the, this idea that Captain Mallow got killed by a fox. He wasn't the sort of rabbit he had killed by a fox. Um, you know, that it was just this, this, you know, this freak kind of bad luck, almost as, as bizarrely bad luck as Captain Charlock being run down on the Iron Road by a train, of all things. Um, so we have this, this, so this is the second time. Uh, the fox is a slightly less spectacular messenger of El Herrera, perhaps, um, but uh, but nevertheless, he does in fact seem to play that role. Um, and uh, he... Um, but also notice how Bigwig is involved with that. Um, Bigwig just feels sort of strange. He's strangely restless and does what really is a foolish thing, and Hazel's furious at him for doing it, right? For risking himself and um, uh, he's, yes, uh, as, uh, uh, Carita, do you go by Carita or Carrie? I think you sent an email which you signed Carrie, right? I just want to make sure I'm calling you the right thing, uh, or pronouncing your name right at all, frankly. I don't have any idea. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I, Carita says, our strong and confident bigwig being on edge served a good purpose. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, it's, it's, again, it seemed a really fluke thing. It seemed even a piece of strikingly bad judgment uh, on Bigwig's part. And yet, this uh, sort of freak, foolish action of his turned out to be, you know, this sort of miraculous eucatastrophe um, for, uh, uh, for the Watership Down uh, rabbits in that moment. And, uh, you know, we might dismiss, perhaps somebody could dismiss, uh, you know, the fiery messenger of Frith as merely a train and a coincidence, um, but coincidences seriously um, uh, 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 begin to mount here. Um, Several people, uh, Patrick and uh, uh, Tom Hillman, uh, Patrick Summers and Tom Hillman, are both uh, recalling... um, 
the uh, the references to luck in the Hobbit and the uh, you know if chance you call it uh, uh, Nick Marazzo as well um, uh, in the Lord of the Rings and that's exactly how it uh, begins to sound to me uh, pretty quickly um, so uh, yeah it's um, it's I'm not trying to oversimplify the narrative you know Sarah Lagarde asks a really great um, question, you know, as readers, are we supposed to be thinking about a role of providence here? You know, she says, I know that from my early readings, I was taking it as some form of divine intervention in Hazel's Warren's favor. It does sound like that. I mean, but it's it's still relatively subtle. I mean, we're not getting um, um, you know, we're not going like full deus ex machina mode, right? We're not getting, you know, gods popping up out of the trap door and setting everything to rights. Um, but we do begin to see, as I said, am I was joking in my subtitle, sort of signs of a conspiracy. We have a bunch of times where things just work out well. Now, very little is given to them, right? It's not that like things are just made easy for them. Um, it still requires them to do all of their utmost. They still are only saved by their wits and courage and everything else. I mean, I don't think that the, um, you know, the collection of circumstances which seem so remarkably to favor the Watership Down Enterprise, um, I don't think that they, that lessens the heroism of the rabbits involved. And I think that that balance is something that, um, Adams maintains really well, and I think is really crucial to maintain. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, I think the evidence of of this stuff is clear. And again, especially in context of the explicit faith statements that Holly was making, that really kind of brought it to the surface. Um, you know, there near the end of book two, and once it's been broached, you know, once that's there, um, especially when we'll you know, and we'll come back to this both. Uh, later tonight, perhaps, um, and certainly in later classes, especially the way that the stories of El Herrera begin to be interwoven more and more intimately into the plot, I think, anyway. Um, you know, we, we saw before the ways in which stories like The Blessing of El Herrera and The King's Lettuce are relevant to the story, you know, they, they, they work and normally, of course, for obvious reasons, you know, that is like the story of the blessing of El Herrera is relevant to that moment in the story because that, I mean, that's why Dandelion chose it because it was relevant, right? And they wanted to hear a story um, that was fitting to the circumstances. Um, so it's no coincidence that it's relevant. Um, but I think that we will see the relationship between the El Herrera stories and the narrative begin to change. And this story, the story of the Black Rabbit of El Herrera, the, of El Herrera and, the Bla, and the Black Rabbit of Inlay, um, is, to me, the place where we really begin to see a turning point, um, where the stories of El Herrera cease to be simply, um, you know, these mythical stories which sort of lurk in the background of rabbit culture and consciousness um, and get recalled at crucial moments and begin to be well, differently relevant uh, to the story. And I, I hope you'll see what I mean by that as we move forward. Um, so that reminds me, I want to move forward and talk about Ella Herrera on the Black Rabbit, but actually before we get there, one um, uh, one last uh one last thing I want to do as a, as a kind of transition, because um, there are a couple reasons why I don't want to skip over it, and that is the moment of inspiration, uh, the moment when Blackberry um, works out the rest of his plan. <clears throat> "'What puzzles me,' said Blackberry, "'is why this boat thing doesn't go along. Everything in this river goes along, and fast, too. See there?' He looked out at a piece of stick floating down on the even on the even two mile an hour current. So what's stopping this thing from going? Kehar had a short way with landlubber's manner, which he sometimes used to those of the rabbits that he did not particularly like. Blackberry was not one of his favorites. He preferred straightforward characters like Bigwig, Buckthorn, and Silver. Kehar's kind of a macho guy's guy, you know. <clears throat> Is rope. You like bite him, then you go damn quick, all the way. 
Yes, I see, said Fiverr. The rope goes round that metal thing where Hazel's sitting, and the other end's fixed on the bank here. It's like the stalk of a big leaf. You could not throw in the leaf. The boat would drop off the bank. Well, anyway, let's go back now, said Hazel rather dejectedly. I'm afraid we don't seem to be any nearer to finding what we're looking for, Kehar. Can you possibly wait until tomorrow? I had the idea that we all might move to somewhere a bit drier before tonight, higher up in the wood, away from the river. Oh, what a pity, said Bluebell. Do you know, I'd quite decided to become a water rabbit. And this is, of course, uh, the moment at which... Blackberry has his inspiration uh, and immediately responds with great golden frith, right? Uh, he's He's got it. Now, um, things that I wanted to draw attention to, the reason I wanted to bring up this passage in the context in which I have, that is, in the context of these sort of signs of conspiracy, um, is on the one hand, I think that this passage fits in there, right, for a couple way, uh, reasons. I mean, they need some miraculous way to escape from the Ephraphans, and behold, an unattended boat is lying there and ready for them to use. Um, but it's not just that, right? Um, in addition to that, the mere fact that Bluebell's joke about becoming a water rabbit is the thing that inspires, like, you know, it's it's not just if the boat didn't happen to be there, then they would, you know, then, you know, the plan would have lacked its its crucial feature. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But not only that, but had Bluebell not happened to be near them, right? Remember, they just kind of brought him along because he was there, right? Um, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, in that sense, just a coincidence. So this stray comment made by the one person whose presence in that group is not essential, right? You've got, uh, you know, Bigwig, Blackberry, Fiverr, Hazel, and Kehar, right? That's the ce the central council of war. Those are the five that have been collaborating on the plan, right? And then you've got Bluebell, who's been really curious about it, but that's all, right? And it's the stray comment that's made by Bluebell, which inspires Blackberry's observation, or, or his, you know, his, his insight and, uh, and, uh, and, and the plan. So, um, that's, uh, but, but I, you know, there's more to this as well. It's not just like yet another, co it is yet another coincidence, but it's more than just yet another coincidence. We see also, um, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this too, is that this is also combined with chance, also clearly a fruit of Hazel's principle about every rabbit having worth, right? The fact that the watership down Warren, you know, the, the, the cornerstone of Hazel's leadership has been from the beginning, we're not going to marginalize people. We're not just going to, to, to shove people to the outskirts because they're smaller uh, and weaker than, than you know, the Ausla. Um, everybody has value, right? We, you know, we see, uh, we saw Hazel doubling down on that principle f literally from day one, right? When he and Fiverr spent the entire last day in the Sandalford Warren trying to convince Pipkin of all rabbits. Um, Pipkin, clearly the most useless rabbit in the Sandalford Warren, as small and timorous as Fiverr, but not even prophetic, right? Um, um, but yet again, Hazel's principle that you know, though he doesn't state it in, the, in these terms, um, his his principle that all rabbits have value, and his practice of um, of valuing, of seeing the, the the you know the the good and the strengths in everyone, and listening to everybody, and involving the whole, um, and we see that here paying off. Even Bluebell, whose uh, tendency to make jokes strongly annoyed. Uh, Hazel at first, though I really uh, love the relationship that Blueberry and Hazel uh, adopt, uh, the, you know, the, the relationship that they develop, the way that Hazel always one-ups him um, by sort of turning his jokes back upon him, um, normally by completing the uh, impromptu poetry that, uh, that Bluebell begins in an unflattering way. I particularly love the business about, to f about feeling the blackbird's sudden tug uh, when he is writing his poetry about being a slug. Um, but anyway, um, again, it's Bluebell who is sort of useless in a different way from Pipkin, right? But yet him in his sort of infuriating jokes um, actually um, uh, 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 serve a crucial role. Um, and I'm not trying to, for those of you who like Bluebell, I'm not trying to malign Bluebell. Um, 
but uh, uh, but 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 again, again, he's he's. Uh, uh, <laughs> Kareed is offended uh, at, uh, at, uh, at my uh, disparagement of Bluebell. Um, but again, my point is merely that which seems unlikely, that which the, uh, the superficial and, uh, uh, and, and swift to judge uh, might dismiss and pay no attention to, um, that which perhaps even the Threera in his advanced age might have merely, uh, you know, condescended to or, or, uh, or not taken seriously, um, but which Hazel does take seriously. These things are all paying dividends. Notice how, uh, how active... Pipkin is. Pipkin's actually, I think, a really fascinating study. If you really pay attention to Pipkin and everything that Pipkin does, he's really actually one of the, you know, he doesn't have any superlative features. You know, he's not the smartest, he's not the strongest, uh, but he uh, uh, he's not the fastest, but he has uh, uh, a really quite large role uh, in the story uh, and plays and plays a, plays a pretty big part. Um, one last thing I want to point out here before we move on. And uh, uh, Nancy, I think it was Nancy, um, who, yes, Nancy, it was you, um, uh, made exactly the connection that I was just going to make. Nancy, when I, when I, we, I was reading this, Nancy said, Bluebell should be careful. Uh, that business about becoming a water rabbit sounds a lot like silverweed, and that's just what I was thinking, Nancy, too. Um, now, of course, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Bluebell is one of the only other rabbits who recites poetry. In fact, he's one of... Two, we haven't gotten any other poems, have we? I mean, Fiverr doesn't speak in poetry. Um, Fiverr, you know, does other things, but he speaks in prose. Um, I think Bluebell is the only other versifier that we've met, other than Silverweed, actually. Um, not that I think that Bluebell's jokes are messages from Frith or anything, um, but um, uh, but anyway, I, I, that, that's actually a connection that I hadn't thought of until that very moment. But although Bluebell is not exactly expressing it in the sort of the deep angst-ridden poetry that Silverweed gives us. Um, I don't want to make fun of Silverweed's poem. I find it deeply moving in many ways, as we talked about before. Um, but Nancy's exactly right. Uh, remember, the Silverweed's poem pivoted in those first stanzas on, you know, that take me with you, right? He was going to become rabbit of the wind, rabbit of the stream, rabbit of the leaves. And then that fourth stanza, he was going up to Frith, right? It was about the sun and about Frith. Um... <sighs> So there's a superficial, at least a kind of a joke there, right, about the, you know, when you think of uh, a silver weeds, I shall be rabbit of the stream and Bluebell's uh, uh, decision to become a water rabbit. Um, it sounds like a mere joke. I mean, it sounds like a mere sort of uh, uh, co uh, coincidence or, or sort of point of contrast. And yet, you know, Nancy, I found myself really arrested by that when I was reading it this past time. Um, especially since, as soon as I noticed that, I was like, wait a second. Okay. Rabbit of the Wind was where we started, right, where Silverweed started, anyway. And remember the discussions at the beginning, uh, that at the beginning of book two, I mean, of when they get to Watership Down, right? And they're like, are we going to go up to live among the clouds? Remember uh, the that prayer that Hazel utters to Lord Frith um, because he's nervous about going to live a, among the crowds um, among the clouds, remember that's not a happy thought uh, for the rabbits because um, the clouds are ominous and vaguely threatening but in going to the hills right um, I, they're, it's, they're going up among the clouds uh, you know, they're going to be rabbit of the wind, and now they're going to become rabbit of the stream, and um, um, and then, of course, you have it ending with Frith. <clears throat> we have that third stanza of descending with the leaves down into the dark. Um, are we headed there, too? I'm not trying to say that this is, that the whole, the, that 
the story, the the whole rest of the story sort of maps, or rather, to say it the other way around, that Silverweed's poem maps really sort of in a, in a straightforward manner on the rest of the story. But I can't help but think it's a little bit relevant to it. Um, and I, I think, again, of Fiverr's characterization of Silverweed and of the other singers that Frith sent to the Warren of the Snares, according to Fiverr's uh, uh, telling of the story. Um, Silverweed and Fiverr were very close, right? They're like two clouds that almost merged, but, you know, Fiverr drifted wide, right? Um, does Silverweed have some prophetic insight, um, not just for himself, perhaps not even just for his Warren, um, but in a sense for his, um, you know, and even a kind of prophetic message for the visitors. Remember, that's the context of Silverweed's poem, right? The Dandelion tells the story of the king's lettuces, and his intended audience is primarily the, you know, the rabbits of Cowslip's Warren. Um, they call on their singer to sing a song from their Warren, with the primary audience being uh, the future Watership Down rabbits, um, and he sings his song. So it's a, it's a song to them is there in is there in it some sort of message to them or warning to them or you know just sort of a way in which their the song parallels their story in a way which sort of shows you know i mean it contrasts in a sense of like sickness and health kind of way and yet with a um with a you know a kind of parallelism that suggests a connection there again remember the singers are sent from Frith. They are, they are given messages from Frith. They do. Know, Silverweed does know something. He's he knows secrets, as Fiverr says. Um, but uh, so you know, it, it sounds more and more. The more sort of I think about it in connection with the rest of the story, the more it begins to sound like a kind of warped and ill understood that is warped in the speaker's imagination and through the suffering and situation of the speaker. Um, it's twisted, but yet, I think, potentially, um, still relevant um, and interesting. Anyway, um, I wanted to mention that. Um, but let's move on and talk about something cheerful, like the Black Rabbit of Inlay. Okay, so this is a very unusual El Herrera story. This is the only El Herrera story that we get, um, in which, and we still have one more coming, but it's the only El Herrera story that we get in which um, we don't get the cheerful, roguish El Herrera, right? That has been the staple that has been his, you know, his... Uh, his delight in in mischief and you know in sort of being a rascal um, has been the the most consistent element of El Herrera's character to this point. The story of the Black Rabbit of Inlay is very different, and let's look. Um, there are a few things that I want to look at closely. One is the choice that he makes. Um, at last, El Herrera felt quite desperate. And one night, when he had been risking his life again and again to bring down a few mouthfuls of grass for a doe and her family, whose father had been killed the day before, he called out, Lord Frith, I would do anything to save my people. I would drive a bargain with a stoat or a fox. Yes, or with the black rabbit of Inlay. Now, as soon as he had said this, El Herrera realized in his heart that if there was one creature anywhere who might have the will, and certainly had the power, to destroy his enemies, it was the black rabbit of Inlay. For he was a rabbit, and yet more powerful than King Darzan a thousand times over. But the thought made El Herrera sweat and shudder, so that he had to crouch down where he was in the run. After a time he went to his own burrow, and began to think of what he had said, and what it meant. Okay. What do we see in El Herrera here? Um, well, first, thinking of this passage and the story that follows. Let's just note in passing, and we'll come back to this at the end of our discussion of this story. Um, Bigwig insists on this story. right? This is Bigwig's story. This is what he insists. He almost gets violent with Hazel 
uh, when Hazel says, maybe we should have another story, right? Because here's Hazel being like, hey, let's raise everybody's spirits again, right? Everybody needs a, a bit of a pick-me-up, right? So let's get a story, Dandelion, and everybody is great about that, you know, thinks this is a great idea. And then here's Bigwig insisting on the least uplifting story, at least superficially so, right? Um, least likely to boost and buoy the spirits, um, why? Why is it that Bigwig wants to hear this story? Um, what relevance does this have for Bigwig that he insists that the story must be this one? Um, let's um, come back to that, right? Let's think more about the story, and then we'll come back to that question uh, at the end. Um, so anyway, back to this passage here, looking at the um, nature of Elohera's decision here, right? Remember last time we talked about self-sacrifice, right? Um, in uh, uh, in the context of some of the uh, um, some of the comments that were being made last time, and um, Carrie, wasn't it you that, uh, that was uh, asking about the uh, that was talking about self-sacrifice? Um, here we clearly see Elohera. Now it's you know his desire to uh, drive a bargain with the Black Rabbit of Inlay is only the final step in that, you know, in this path of self-sacrifice that he's already on, right? We see him, you know, risking his life again and again to bring down a few mouthfuls of grass uh, for a doe and her family whose father had been killed the day before. So we see him already, you know, risking himself for others and, and uh, uh, valuing the sacrifice that this other buck in his warren had made um, you know, for them the day before. So, you know, we can see lots of emphasis on the value of self-sacrifice in that way here. Um, but uh, the weight that this is given is very different, right? El runs risks all the time. Um, I mean, he both, I mean, it's he seemed in a hopeless situation um, when uh, his peoples were living in the marshes of Kelfazin, um, you know, before the king's lettuce. I mean, obviously it's not exactly as bad as here, um, but again, he was, he was, uh, he was sufficiently desperate to run a really significant risk in order to attempt to do this uh, almost impossible thing, the stealing of King Darson's lettuces. And you remember how in that case, he just sort of flippantly adds on the top, right? And I will uh, have them delivered, right? Um, you know, I love when he uh, when he uh, he says that to Prince Ren to, to Prince Rainbow. Um, what's different here? What's different between this and the other risks that he's run? His plan to discredit Hufsa in the story of his trial is pretty bold, right? Um, but this is different than that. This is different than the king's lettuces. How is it different? Carita says, uh, it's interesting how terrified he is of the black rabbit. I mean, he's the best rabbit ever, but he's still scared. Yes, um, the black rabbit is depicted in this sort of demigodish way, right? Now, Elohera is the lord of all rabbits, right? He himself... Um, member Fiverr sort of speculating that Elohera seems to be able to go back and forth between this place and that other place, right? Um, um, and yet, you're right, Karita, his relationship with the Black Rabbit is this seems to be about the same as every other rabbit's, right? Um, yeah. He... As, now, Gerald, you're right, as he's... Uh, Gerald points out, you know, the risk is imminent death, no saving throw, as Gerald says. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, it's not even risk, right? That seems to me one of the really important things here. He's not risking his life. He's giving up his life. He is making the choice in cold blood to die for his people. To give his life, because he knows when he goes, he knows. That's what he's trying to bargain with. Um, I would drive a bargain with a stoat or a fox. Um, yes, or with the black rabbit of inlay. Um, and 
driving a bargain with a stoat or a fox. Um, notice it, 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 the phrase, the concept of driving a bargain with a stoat or a fox is interesting, because it's not just like, I shall perform a feat which is very, very difficult, right? Like his, yeah, like the example of the, the sort of the, the mini-story of El Ajuera swimming the lake with a pike in it, right? Um, I don't think this is uh, an El Ajuera and the pike thing when he says I drive a bargain with a stoat or a fox. Um, presumably there's only one thing a stoat or a fox would want in exchange uh, with El Ajuera in a bargain. Um, but there still seems to be a sense of escalation there. A stoat or a fox... Yes, or or with the Black Rabbit of Inlay, right? Or or even with the Black Rabbit of Inlay. Um, there's only one way that that bargain could go. Uh, no tricks, as Philip says. It seems like he's run out of tricks at this point. Um, uh, so it's just, will he accept my life? In, he, in his his attempts to trick the Black Rabbit are simply to get him to accept his life in exchange for the lives of his people. Um, so the certainty of death, the, his confrontation with the certainty of death, um, is what sobers him about the idea of the Black Rabbit of Inlay. And indeed, that's kind of what's sobering about the Black Rabbit of Inlay. Um, as it's hard not to read the Black Rabbit of Inlay as at least sort of quasi-allegorical, um, that is, as, a, as, as like a kind of allegory for death. Um, look at the description of the Black Rabbit. Now, as you all know, and I love that movement in the story there. Now, as you all know, the Black Rabbit of Inlay is fear and everlasting darkness. He is a rabbit, but he is that cold, bad dream from which we can only entreat Lord Frith to save us today and tomorrow. When the snare is set in the gap... The black rabbit knows where the peg is driven, and when the weasel dances, the black rabbit is not far off. You all know how some rabbits seem just to throw their lives away between two jokes and a theft, but the truth is that their foolishness comes from the black rabbit, for it is by his will that they do not smell the dog or see the gun. The black rabbit brings sickness, too, or again, he will come in the night and call a rabbit by name, and then that rabbit must go out to him even though he may be young and strong to save himself from any other danger. Bigwig in the trench, you'll remember. He goes with the Black Rabbit and leaves no trace behind. Some say that the Black Rabbit hates us and wants our destruction, but the truth is, or so they taught me, that he too serves Lord Frith, and does no more than his appointed task, to bring about what must be. We come into the world, and we have to go. But we, do, but we do not go merely to serve the turn of one enemy or another. If that were so, we would all be destroyed in a day. We go by the will of the Black Rabbit of Inlay, and only by his will. And though that will seems hard and bitter to us all, yet in his way he is our protector, for he knows Frith's promise to the rabbits, and he will avenge any rabbit who may chance to be destroyed without the consent of himself. Anyone who has seen a gamekeeper's gibbet knows what the Black Rabbit can bring down on Elil, who think they will do what they will. The gamekeeper's gibbet, of course, is where you would see the skins of foxes and uh, weasels and things stretched. Um, what do you notice here? Um... The Black Rabbit... I said I say quasi-allegorical. I certainly think it is not... It, it does not seem at all fitting with the story as we have it to simply read the Black Rabbit as a personification of death. He's not just a personification of death, but he's a lot like a personification of death. Um, he... Uh, he has that kind, he is identified with death uh, very closely he brings death he is the master of death again i don't think he is merely um okay what's the rabbit form of anth 
anthrop like if you uh, anthropomorphize something, making it like a human, would you lapinomorphize something to make it like a rabbit? Yeah, I think that must be it. Yes, lapinomorphize. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Okay, all right, yes. Um, uh, he's not just the, let me see if I can do it, the lapinomorphiz... How would I say it? Anth Anthrop anthropomorphic I don't even know how I would say the normal noun verb um, <laughs> Kate Neville just suggests bonify yes that's good he's not just the bonifaction uh, of death um, he's uh, he's he's a rabbit he's a character um, who's associated with death he has the power of death um, but he uh, but again, there's 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 a kind of a blurry line there, um, and the way that he is associated with death is more direct than just one who has the power uh, and happens to have the job uh, to kill many. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, uh, Thomas Johnson says dandelions clarification that the black rabbit is not an enemy of rabbits reminds me of Fiverr's insistence that elsewhere is not a paradise as some rabbits believe. Um, uh, it seems to challenge traditional Judeo-Christian notion um, of death as an offspring of sin, says Thomas. Yes, though that kind of um, sort of spiritual conclusion hasn't really been suggested, I think, at any point um, uh, in the story here. Um, We've seen that from the beginning, right? With, uh, in as much as the story of the blessing of the of Elachera did contain a kind of uh, fall from the golden age element, right? You know, in that way, it's very, very much like, you know, uh, a lot of um, you know, beginning of the world myths. Um, but it, um, but in that story, there was not, although there was the coming of increased death to rabbits um, by the newfound uh, uh, carnivorousness of the Elo, um, we didn't have a immortality to mortality shift that wasn't associated, you know, there wasn't a taboo broken. So a lot of the traditional frameworks of um, sort of the Judeo-Christian spiritual worldview there haven't really been suggested um, at any point, really, um, in the um, in the rabbit worldview. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Carolyn Morehouse says, the black rabbit can sympathize and empathize with the rabbits and not just take them on uh, to they know not where. Um, yes, he is, in his way, their protector, um, for he knows Frith's promise to the rabbits. Um, yeah, he knows that the rabbits are never to be destroyed, right? And although he does take the rabbits and take them uh, frequently, right? I mean, rabbits die quite a lot. All the world shall be their enemy. Um, yet, he knows Frith's promise um, that the rabbits will never be destroyed. Um, I, too, I, I agree. I think that Dandelion's sort of philosophical uh, digression there, sort of theological slash philosophical digression there, um, is interesting, and seems to me to state more clearly some of the things that were implied in his in the Blessing of El Herrera story, um, the way in which uh, it's Frith, of course, who turns the Elil on the rabbits while simultaneously blessing El Herrera. Um, you know, it is, this is how Frith has ordained the world to be. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, interesting. Josh says, uh, you know, the the passage there about the black ra the actions of the black rabbit on a rabbit uh, uh, said it reminds him of Hazel. He smells the dog, uh, but he doesn't see the gun. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing, you know, Josh, thinking about that um, and thinking about the conversation we were having at the beginning of class. It does seem to point again... Again, if Dandelion's theology is correct here, um, then... And if we can assume that Dandelion is kind of speaking, you know, for the, for the, for the people here, is sort of 
um, an accurate spoke. And the fact that they all not only accept but really admire him as a storyteller seems to me to suggest that he sort of his stories have the endorsement of the you know of the rabbit culture in general. There. Um, uh, so if if again if we are to take Dandelion's words as culturally normative in that sense, um, then I think we do see more evidence of their belief in providence, right? In a supernatural guidance of all things. We might not understand. Here he's talking about the the misfortunes of rabbit life, right? Um, particularly death in various forms, sickness, and the uh, the attack of Elil, and you know a rabbit being caught and throwing his life away, even foolishly. Um, and again, you know, here, Josh, I'm I'm reminded of Hazel again, right? Um, is the uh, the mood that led him to defy Fiverr's warning, right? Um, was uh, you know, think of all the the examination we did of those passages. Is you know, is uh, the the red flag that that something off that we couldn't exactly put our fingers on. Um, at least I couldn't. Um, are we to understand that here simply as the black rabbit? Right, that's the black rabbit influencing Hazel. Um, um, right, as Philip says, or big wig with the fox. Right, yeah, sure. Exactly. Um, that's the kind of way that a fox acts when the black rabbit stirs them, when the black rabbit moves them. Um, that there is this sense that there is a kind of supernatural power at work through all the... You know, this is not something that's been a main dominant thread of this story so far, um, but we do get these um, these glimpses into the fact that at least some of them, um, and they, that seems to vary somewhat... Um, but at least some of them have a pretty strong, um, a pretty strong faith into this kind of thing. Um, my favorite Black Rabbit of Inlay passage. Um, Pipkin has just excused himself, right? And Fiverr's taken him out. Go on, said Bigwig, and don't leave anything out. I think many things are left out, if only the truth could be known, said Dandelion. For no one can say what happens in that country where Elacrera went of his own accord, and we do not. But, as I was told, when they first became aware of the Black Rabbit, they fled down the tunnel, as needs they must, for there was nowhere else to run. And this they did, although they had come on purpose to encounter him, and all depended on their doing so. They did no differently from all of us, and the end, too, was no different. For when they had done slipping and tripping and falling along the tunnel, they found themselves in a vast stone burrow. All was of stone. The Black Rabbit had dug it out of the mountain with his claws." And there they found, waiting for them, him from whom they had fled. There were others in that burrow also, shadows without sound or smell. The black rabbit has his Owsla too, you know. I would not care to meet them. Dandelion really is a good storyteller. The black rabbit spoke with the voice of water that falls into pools and echoing places in the dark. Um, I mostly... Uh, uh, just included that last line simply because I love that metaphor so much. Um, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, but um, yeah, Mark asks, what does it mean when he starts his description of the black rabbit, um, you know, of this very mythical being, by saying he is a rabbit? Mark, I think that's exactly to fend off a reading that he's simply an allegory, right? That he's just an abstraction. That when they talk about the black rabbit, they're talking about death, right? And they're, I'll use the normal term, they're personifying death, right? Um, in the form of the black rabbit. But that's just a kind of superstition. It's kind of a figure of speech. Really, it's just death that they're talking about. Um, but that's Dandelion. So that, that that's why Dandelion insists at the beginning he is a rabbit, right? And notice we get these reminders, right? He is a rabbit who digs his burrow out of solid stone, but he's still a rabbit who digs a burrow, right? Um, um, 
Yeah, Kurita asks, like, Aslan is a lion. Um, uh, with whiskers and uh, a mane and tail and everything. Um, uh, as uh, Bree the horse finds uh, in uh, the horse and his boy. Um, yes, though I don't want to go too far down that road. But, um, uh, but yes. The, so, I, so Mark, anyway, that's, why, that's, how, that's, how, that's how I understand that. Um, but, um, but again, this moment... Um, if there's one sentence which sounds most quasi allegorical, it would be uh, that I that my my okay I love that metaphor at the end, but um, uh, and they found and there they found waiting for them him from whom they had fled. Um, I uh, I love this. I almost. Called, I almost titled the class "Him from Whom They Had Fled," uh, but uh, uh, it didn't quite do the uh, connection between the black rabbit and woundwort thing that I wanted to do. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, Nancy, I think that's a good point. Nancy points out that his being a rabbit is important to the compassion he shows Alahera in this story, and his insistence that he's not one of the Elil. Yes, yes, um, uh, yeah. Um, Yana says he's not just a and uh, Yana uh, Steen Redeker was pointing out how eerie he finds it when I talk about Yana the Hedgehog which is spelled differently but sounds uh, almost exactly the same um, it's okay Yana I'm not assuming that you have fleas like I, I like Bluebell said uh, but anyway um, Yana says uh, he's not just a rabbit he's a mirror of all rabbits with an Ausla and a warren and everything um, he's not just a, a rabbit specter of sorts um, yes, he is. There's a sense in which he is the greatest of all the rabbits, right? There's a sense in which he's something like, you know, I don't know. Well, El Herrera is the ultimate rabbit, right? He is the quintessential rabbit. Um, but the black rabbit is more power, much more powerful than El Herrera. Um, he is... But he is a rabbit. And he still has all of these things in common. Um, you know, all these, even even the social, I mean, the fact is, you know, Daniel points out that he has an Ausla, right? Um, and they call him Inle Ra, right? I love that. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, his connection to El is really, uh, is really emphasized. Um, although Kurita points out there are no mutters uh, in, uh, in uh, the Black Rabbit's Warren. Well, at least we never see them. Um, yeah. Yeah, Emily says it hurts to see El Herrera so compromised in this story. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Emily. I found this story so painful to read as a child um, because I so wanted El Herrera to win. You know, I was waiting and waiting. I felt like every time I read it, no matter how many times I'd read it before, every time I was waiting and waiting for El Herrera to do something clever to pull it out. Right, um, to find some way, um, even after being hideously maimed, having his ears and tail and whiskers cut off, um, and um, you know his uh, desperate courage and um, uh, and uh, and ingenuity in you know his plan to spread the white blindness among King Darzan soldiers, you know that was. Uh, um, sort of a terrible story. I mean, of course, I couldn't help but think of the trick that they played on King Darzan, right, with Rab Scuttle pretending to be terribly sick from the lettuces, um, and, you know, the way in which that would serve as, like, this sort of horrible, you know, return or reversal um, of uh, the trick that he played on King Darzan in the first place. Um, but, of course, even that doesn't work. Um, as Gerald Michael points out, um, you can't win against death, right? Uh, and and Tom Hillman says sometimes you can't win by being clever. You have to suffer for it. Um, yeah, I mean that. Those two things, both of those, I think are true, and those are the hard truths of this story. I didn't like it as a kid. I really wanted to see El Herrera just have a like an un, you know, broken record. Uh, of not only success, but fun success. Uh, I was waiting for this story to get fun at some point, uh, and it never did that. Um, 
but um, um, but yeah, but I agree. I think that that is the one of the important lessons. Um, you know, Tom, as you say, sometimes you have to suffer. Um, sometimes you can only win by suffering and by sacrificing yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, Josh Evans says, I felt at the end of the story that El Ajera's greatest attribute was that he never gave up. Uh, and you're right, and that's, um, that's a... Um, it's a factor that can sort of get eclipsed by the fact that he... Um, uh, that is e eclipsed by the fact that he is, you know, really clever and resourceful, right? It seems to be mostly about his cleverness and resourcefulness. Um, but yeah, his, uh, his determination is really important. The, you know, the fact that he will, that he, you know, he, he, he never gives up. Um, yeah, as Emily says, what he's willing to endure for his people. Yes. Now, Kate Neville is chiding me, um, saying, of course, El Herra does win. His people are saved, right? Um, Yes, yes, that's true. Um, uh, and as Yana points out, his persistence is rewarded by the Black Rabbit in the end. Um, in fact, I want to I wanna go there now. El Herrera said, the, I don't know how to do the voice of the Black Rabbit. El Herrera said the Black Rabbit at last. I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to, like, how to make my voice like water that falls into pools and echoing places in the dark, so... Uh, I, 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 maybe if I were like James Earl Jones, I could do that. But um, um, I guess I think I always did imagine the Black Rabbit's voice being something like Darth Vader's voice. But anyway, um, El Herrera, this is a cold warren, a bad place for the living and no place at all for warm hearts and brave spirits. You are a nuisance to me. Go home. I myself will save your people. Do not have the impertinence to ask me when. There is no time here. They are already saved. In that moment, when King Darzan and his soldiers were still jeering down the holes of the warren, confusion and terror came upon them in the falling darkness. The field seemed full of huge rabbits with red eyes stalking among the thistles. They turned and fled. They vanished in the night, and that is why no rabbit who tells the tales of El Herrera can say what kind of creatures they were or what they looked like. Not one of them has ever been seen from that day to this. Um... And uh, um, remember, we talked about that back in the King's Lettuce. You know, what is King Darzan? What kind of animal is King Darzan? And, and uh, you know, we're looking. It looked like there was more than one kind of animal, maybe, in King Darzan City. Um, but, uh, but it never specified. And of course, now we learn why. Um, uh, his people are delivered. The how and the why... I think are interesting. Why? Why did the Black Rabbit relent, exactly? Is it a question of merit? It could be a question of merit. That is, perhaps the Black Rabbit is moved with compassion. That's a little hard to imagine, though. I mean, he's the Black Rabbit of Inlay. If the Black Rabbit of Inlay were prone to compassion... Remember what he says to El Herrera, right? He's like... Oh, you want, to you want to give your life for your people? He's like, look, not a day goes by when some doe doesn't offer to give her life for her litter or some brave captain, captain of Alsway to give his life for his chief rabbit, right? Um, I get offered that kind of bargain all the time. He says, sometimes I grant it, sometimes I take it, sometimes I don't. Um, but that, to me, it's one of the most crushing things about this story, that sense of, you know, El Herrera doing this incredibly brave, completely self-sacrificing thing, and the Black Rabbit being like, meh, you know, um, it's not that special. People, you know, rabbits do this all the time. Um, I'm not interested. I'm not going to take your sacrifice. Um, so does he relent because he has compassion? He's the rabbit of death, man. If the rabbit of death were real prone to compassion, he wouldn't be very good at his job, right? So merely having compassion on El Herrera's suffering seems a little unlikely, and certainly that's not the tone of voice he speaks in. You are a nuisance to me, he says. Now, you could argue, maybe he's just being understated, right? Uh, but... Um, uh, 
the fact that he is that Elahera is annoying him, is, you know, as Michael Cheskovsky is pointing out, does is the reason that he gives, right? Um, um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Kate Neville and Karita Alexander at the same time uh, are uh, making a parallel uh, to the parable of the unjust judge uh, in the Gospels. Um, that is the, 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 the parable. It's a parable that Jesus tells to illustrate why you should pray frequently um, without giving up. Um, and it's the story of this widow, this poor widow who uh, is... Um, uh, is trying to get her case heard uh, by this judge who won't hear her case, and she keeps knocking and knocking and knocking, and uh, and finally the judge, like not because he cares, but just because he wants to get rid of her, um, uh, agrees to give her justice. Um, uh, be persistent, uh, says. It's a very peculiar par- a parable in many ways, um, but uh, but anyway, it's it does sound like that. It has that tone. Right, you are a nuisance to me. Go home. I myself will save your people. Um, but notice, it's not just you keep asking and asking and asking. I'm so sick of it. Right, but this is a cold warren, a bad place for the living, and no place at all for warm hearts and brave spirits. Why is he a nuisance to him? Presumably not just because he's there trying to bargain his life, as the black rabbit says. He gets these bargains all the time, right? But. <clears throat> he is a alive people they keep saying you don't belong here right he is a trespasser there and they don't seem to like him there because not only is he alive he's also a warm heart and a brave spirit and he doesn't seem to want him there uh, for that reason um Anyway, I think it's it's um, a fascinatingly unsatisfying. At least I've ne- I've never felt it satisfying. Again, just like the way that the black rabbit just caves and says they are already saved, right? Um, it's a win, but it doesn't feel like a win exactly. Um, uh, Yeah, it, uh, Thomas Johnson makes an interesting remark. He says, The black rabbit's awareness that the white blindness is spread via flea bites seems like information to which rabbits would not normally be privy. Is this a proof that the black rabbit is a real supernatural being who knows things that Dandelion would not? Uh, Tom, I was thinking of the same thing um, uh, during, you know, when I was reading it this past time. Um, that is a remarkable kind of thing. I mean, I I'm perfectly willing to believe that that's true, um, but uh, <clears throat> but it definitely is not something you would expect rabbits to know. Um, so the very f- so it suggests Thomas not only that the black rabbit of Inlay has supernatural knowledge that your average rabbit wouldn't have, but that the stories that Dandelion is telling have some kind of genuinely authoritative provenance if contained within that oral tradition of which uh, Dandelion is the heir and the, um, uh, you know, and the passer-on, um, if, that, if that contains that knowledge, which normal rabbits wouldn't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sharon Powell is suggesting that the you know the saving of the Warren is an example of rabbit grace. Um, it does seem to be grace, Sharon, the reversal on the black rabbit's part, right? Going from I'm not going to accept your life in exchange for your people, um, which seems to be not just I'm saying no to you, Elifar, but like I'm I'm going to let all your people die. That's the way it is. It's fine, right? Um, and instead he shifts around completely, right? Not only am I going to save your people, but I'm not even going to kill you either, right? I'm not going to, um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm still not going to accept your sacrifice, but I'm going to save your people anyway. Um, and he saves them by means of terror, 
right? These shadowy black rabbits. Now, maybe those are his Ausla, right? Who come? Maybe if they're not mere apparitions. That those are the Ausla of the black rabbit, um, who are who come in person to vanquish the foe, um, and they are actually destroyed. We don't really know, of course, the fate of the soldier of the soldiery of King Darzan. Um, but uh, now, two questions left about the black rabbit story. Um, and you know what my second one is? My first one is, what's the moral of this story? Um, the epilogue, in a sense, of the Black Rabbit story, that is, the return to the Warren to find that the younger generation of rabbits who've been born since then have no recollection, right? Have no memory, have well, have no respect um, for the memory of what came before um, is um, um, is you know is sort of a, 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 a striking moment, um, but uh, what I find even more fascinating is the very end. Oh, sorry, backwards here, or rather going forwards instead of backwards. Um, his meeting with Frith. This is only the second... Frith hasn't occurred, hasn't appeared directly in any of the Elohera stories since the blessing at the beginning. And then he makes an appearance here at the end. Are you angry, Elohera? asked Lord Frith. No, my lord, replied Elohera. I am not angry. Presumably at the young rabbits that he just met, or at, you know, the black rabbit, or the world in general uh, after what he's just experienced to give so much for these rabbits and come home to find them utterly unappreciative of what he's done and what the others did before them. I'm not angry, but I have learned that that, uh, that with creatures one loves, suffering is not the only thing for which one may pity them. A rabbit who does not know a, when a gift has made him safe is poorer than a slug, even though he may think otherwise himself. Wisdom is found on the desolate hillside, Elohera, where none comes to feed, and the stony bank where the rabbit scratches a hole in vain. But speaking of gifts, I have brought a few trifles for you, a pair of ears, a tail, and some whiskers. You may find the ears slightly strange at first. I put a little starlight in them, but it is really quite faint. Not enough, I am sure, to give away a clever thief like you. And this is where the story breaks off, right after this. Now, what stra the reason I asked the question, what is the moral of the story, doesn't that seem like a shockingly crass question to ask at the end of a, a, an Elohera story? Um, but the reason that I ask it is that this ending to the story does strike me indeed as very peculiar. Um, and peculiar exactly because it does seem to go in exactly that kind of direction. Wisdom is found on the desolate hillside, El Huera, where none comes to feed, and the stony bank where the rabbit scratches a hole in vain. That begins to sound something like a moral of the story. Right, or that is Frith emphasizing to Elahuera. Um Again, Frith, of course, is much more subtle than this. But doesn't that sound somewhat like? Can you now reflect and see what you've you know? Let's talk about what we've learned, Elahuera, during this process. Right? What have you taken from this? from the whole thing, presumably, from the suffering of the people to his decision to, self, to sacrifice himself to the time with the Black Rabbit and his failure to achieve what he tried to achieve, um, and then his return to find that sacrifice totally unacknowledged and unappreciated. Um, wisdom is found on the desolate hillside where none comes to feed, and the stony bank where the rabbit scratches a hole in vain. And that transition. But speaking of gifts, he says, um, I read that backwards to mean wisdom is a gift. Wisdom is the gift 
a frith, right? But wisdom is only given uh, through, is only given on the desolate, it's only found, rather, not given, it's only found on the desolate hillside where none comes to feed, and the stony bank where the rabbit scratches a hole in vain. Um, and the applicability of that is pretty broad, right? It, on the one hand, explains why those rabbits, those young rabbits he was talking to, are fools, right? Because they've not been on any desolate hillsides or tried to dig in any stony banks, right? They have been sheltered successfully by Elohera's sacrifice and the courage of the older generation of rabbits, and therefore they've grown they're they've grown up safe and secure and therefore they lack that particular wisdom um uh, i can't help it um it uh uh it reminds me uh of Aragorn's words about Barlam and Butterbur at the Council of Elrond, right? You know, if simple people are kept free from care, then simple they will be. Um, uh, Michael Cheskowski was just thinking the same thing, so there you go. Justified. See, Michael, I should have waited, then I could have given you credit for it, and then uh, I could have pretended like I, it wasn't me wanting to make a Tolkien reference. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's part of what Frith is saying, but of course it also applies to Elohera himself, right? Elohera himself has gained wisdom. Just as his ears are now going to be, his new ears are going to be now full of starlight. Um, not enough to give him away, but uh, but they might seem a little, str they're going to be different, though. They're going to seem a little strange to him at first. Um, uh, they, uh, so too, this whole situation was a gift given to Elohim, the, the wisdom that he has found in it um, is the gift of Frith to him. Um, and in this way, too, perhaps, we can see the Black Rabbit being the instrument, um, being the servant of Lord Frith, and not in opposition to him or working separate from him. Um, yeah. So, it James Stevens asks, Is Elahera the poorer rabbit who does not know when a gift has made him safe, the gift being the black rabbit saving his people? I think, James, I think not, but there is a risk there, right? That is, Elahera could react in that direction. Um, I don't think he is, but, 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 but I think that there, it, it is, there is a potential that that could apply to him in that way, too. There's a kind of warning for him there, as well, perhaps. Um, uh, and notice the very neglect of the rabbits of of the rabbits that he returns to in the warren almost helps save him from that. Had he come back, and everybody responded by saying, "Elohera is the hero. Elohera saved us." No, he didn't. Right? Um, you know, James. Maybe he would have been one who. Um, does not know when a gift has made him safe, right? It's possible that he, you know, that's a possible outcome, right? But that's not one that we've seen. Why? Well, in part because of the gift of wisdom that Frith has given him. So, okay, back to my question. Why does Bigwig insist on hearing this story? There are some superficial reasons, right? Bigwig is in a grim kind of frame of mind. Uh, so he wants a grim story uh, about the rabbit Grim Reaper. He, uh, um, You could see it as just a, a kind of perverse twist on Bigwig's part, right? I'm feeling like crap, so I want a story that makes you feel like crap. That doesn't really seem like a great idea, but maybe... You know, you could try to defend that, um, uh, but I don't think so. Um, why then? What do you think Bigwig wants to hear? Remember, to don't leave anything out, he says. Um, 
Gerald Michael says, Bigwig is about to take a great risk and wants some reassurance that the risk is worth it. Okay. Um, my suspicion... Remember, it was right It was right after El Herrera arrives at the Black Rabbit's burrow that Pipkin leaves, there's the interruption, and Bigwig says, you know, go on Dandelion and don't leave anything out. In context, my theory is that when Bigwig says don't leave anything out, what he's in particular talking about are the most gruesome details, right? Which I assume means the details of the sufferings of El Herrera, his maiming, right, uh, by the Black Rabbit in his Ausla. Um, that horrible image, terrible image, of El Herrera with his bloody stumps of ears and no whiskers and his tail ripped out, uh, and Rab Scuttle just weeping and weeping over him. Uh, Rab Scuttle is such a moving character in this story. Um, begging, begging his master to leave and to give up. Um, I would guess that those are the details that Bigwig wants to make sure that Dandelion doesn't skim over, right? Don't give us any, like, and he suffered a great deal and then kind of business, right? Don't skip any of it. Um, in which case, if I'm right, that those are the details that he in particular does not want um, Dandelion to skip, or fears Dandelion might be tempted to skip over, um, then it would seem that it's the suffering of El Herrera, um, and El Herrera's willingness to embrace suffering that Big Big is interested in, which makes some sense, of course, uh, in context, as Bigwig is facing that kind of a situation. Bigwig knows. Um, you know, we see already by the end of this reading what step one of the plan is, right? That Bigwig is going to be the one who's going to go on the inside in Ephrathah um, by enlisting with Woundward. Um, and, you know, they've said several times, it can, you know, you're, you're the only one who can do this, Bigwig, because they know Bigwig is the only one who would be accepted. If any of the rest of them went into Ephrathah, they would just be shoved into one of the marks, right? But Bigwig, being so big and so strong and so confident, he's the only one who has a chance of being placed in a position where he could actually do some good on the inside, right? Who might be accepted into the Ausla right away. Um, and, um, uh, anyway, so, but Bigwig knows that in going into Ephrathah, there is a very significant chance that he's going to be giving up his life, that he's going to be sacrificing his life um, and suffering. And we can even see some parallels, right? We have, you know, Black Avar with his ears ripped up. Um, not exactly the same as the apparently surgical removal of El Herrera's ears. They do practice general anesthesia, uh, the uh, Black Rabbit's Ausla, apparently. Um, but, uh, um, but we certainly can see the applicability um, and how Bigwig may be identifying himself with El Herrera and wanting to identify himself with El, with El Herrera in this particular story. Um, uh, Tom Hillman was saying Bigwig is Fey here, and he certainly acts Fey, um, F-E-Y. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that particular Tolkien word. I call it a Tolkien word because Tolkien is like one of the only people uh, in the last 300 years that has used that word, though he didn't make it up. Uh, it's an old word, but uh, almost nobody uses it. Um, but uh, 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 to be fey is to go willingly to death is the literal definition of it, but um, though Tolkien's use of it is a good deal more complicated than that. Um, but uh, but anyway, yeah, that's that's how I always used to read it too. Um, my own sort of simplistic reaction to Bigwig and this story and his fixation on this story um, when I was a kid was simply like I'm feeling anxious and depressed, and so like I want an anxious and depressing story. But I th think not. I think that Bigwig is looking for hope. Uh, and that ultimately the end of this story is what he was hoping for. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, um, 
Yeah, Kate Neville was recalling Black of our, um, as well. Um, yeah, it's just, well, uh, never mind. Okay, we'll get to that next time. That's, uh, that's a next week issue. We haven't gone to that yet. Um, yeah, <laughs> Kurita suggests he needs to hear about something even scarier than what he is about to face. Yes, looking at Ella Prera's determination and his courage in the face of certain death, whereas howsoever grim may be the prospect that is facing Bigwig, he is not at least facing certain death the way that Ella Herrera believed himself to be. Um, well, uh, uh, let's move on as, uh, I still want to talk about Ephrafa and Woundwort here. Um, I think that the, the story of Ella Herrera and the Black Rabbit gives us a really fascinating frame for what comes next. And in particular, I'm really interested in sort of this four-way sort of matrix of leaders, of chief rabbits, right? El Herrera, the black rabbit, he is in Leira, after all. El Herrera, the black rabbit, Hazel, and General Woundwort. Um, the way that the two of them, El Herrera and the black rabbit, give us a kind of a mythic backdrop to then the mortal conflict that we get and the sort of uh, matching of wits between Hazel and his people um, and General Woundward. Um I think that that provides us a really important context that we can't completely forget about. The connections that I was making mostly in jest between Woundward and the Black Rabbit in my class title today, um, I, I think that, that that link is something that really sort of struck me more. Remember, you know, again, that scene, my favorite scene in The Black Rabbit that I mentioned before, when they run away from him, and they but they find themselves down his burrow, and there he is facing them, right? They find in front of them him from whom they fled. Um, remember, Woundward is almost exactly like that, right? Woundward sends out the general, pa- the, the great patrols, right? And when you're out on great patrol, you might find Woundward standing there waiting for you. Um, right, it's you know that that parallel really sort of struck me this time uh, with Woundwort and the Black Rabbit, and just you know his size and his uh, uh, his grimness uh, and his uh, um, and his, uh, his 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 association with death. Um, <laughs> Kate Neville uh, says she wants to talk about the Lapine Oath, Frith in a barn. Um, Actually, I think that uh, uh, lapine cussing is actually a really interesting subject of conversation. Uh, in fact, um, here's homework. Somebody collect for me the collected swear words of rabbits, um, and let's look at those, because actually I think that that would be a really interesting glimpse at rabbit culture. Um, so somebody gather those together, and let's, 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 let's look at those later on, maybe in our... In our uh, um, our second bonus class. Um, yeah, okay, anyway. Um, one thing about... We've talked a lot about Hazel. I don't want to spend too much time talking... Because, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at Hazel's leadership and his relationship with his, uh, with his people, with his Warren. Um, one last moment that I think... You know, the, the emphasis that we get... Um, and... No, I've been laying a lot of emphasis on the beginnings of books. Remember, there's that passage at the beginning of book two that I was emphasizing about, you know, there was no more doubting of Bigwig's strength or Hazel's leadership or Blackberry's wits or Fiverr's insight. Um, and uh, I, um, I... So I wanted to emphasize also this passage at the beginning of uh, of book three, which seemed to me very interesting. Hazel had said nothing more to persuade them, feeling that it would be better simply to leave things to set in his favor. He knew that they were afraid, for he was afraid himself. Indeed, he guessed that they, like himself, could not be free from the thought of Ephrafa and its grim Ausla. But working against this fear was their longing and need to find more does, and the knowledge that there were plenty of does in Ephrafa. Then there was their sense of mischief. All rabbits love to trespass and steal when it comes and when it comes to the point, very few will admit that they are afraid to do so. 
unless, like Buckthorn and Strawberry on this occasion, they know that they are not fit, and that their bodies may let them down in the pitch, in the pinch. Again, in speaking about his secret plan, Hazel had aroused their curiosity. He had hoped that, with Fiverr behind him, he could lure them with hints and promises, and he had been right. The rabbits trusted him in Fiverr, who had gotten them out of Sandleford before it was too late, crossed the Enborn and the Common, taken Bigwig out of the wire, founded the Warren on the Downs, made an ally of Kehar, and produced two does against all odds. There was no telling what they would do next. But they were evidently up to something, and since Bigwig and Blackberry seemed to be confidently in on it, no one was ready to say that he would rather stay out, especially since Hazel had made it clear that anyone who wished could remain at home and welcome. Implying, implying that if he was so poor-spirited as to choose to miss the exploit, they could do without him. Um, uh, yeah. Um, ooh, so before we go on and talk about this passage, um, Yana wants to compare um, Bigwig's desire to hear the story of Elahrera and the Black Rabbit of Inlay, with Aragorn's choice to tell the story of Baron and Luthien in the Dell under Weathertop. Love the connection, Yana. That sounds like an awesome paper topic. That sounds like a brilliant paper topic. I look forward uh, to a uh, paper uh, on that subject <coughs> at Mythmoot next year. That sounds perfect. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, this passage, I think, does a wonderful job of showing a, a bunch of things, right? But it shows Hazel's leadership, right? It shows Hazel's, um, uh, it shows Hazel's ability to, oh, well, I mean, so what does it show? And what do I mean by saying it shows his leadership, right? It shows Hazel's leadership style. Hazel is extremely He's ex he's extremely uh, democratic, right? He speaks for the people. Um, the job of the chief rabbit is to sort of crystallize the sentiment of the entire Warren. Um, he is an absolutely bottom up leader, not a top down leader, right? Not only does he speak for the riffraff and and uh, include everybody, as we've seen many times, um, but he desires to sort of express the desires and uh, and and work with the the um, you know, the thoughts and responses of everybody. Woundwort, of course, being a very top-down leader, right, and asserting his will upon others. And we don't see... We notice how carefully Hazel is refusing to assert his will on anybody, right? He's not even trying... Not only is he not going to force people, he's not going to try to convince them, right? He's just going to invite them, make it attractive for them to come. He's, uh, he's wily... Right, he's uh, he's even in this case manipulative, um, but he's not forceful. Um, yeah, Nancy, I certainly agree. There are there are few, there are um, um, uh, there are less kind ways to characterize Woundworth's leadership style than top down. Um, but I just thought I'd start with that. Um, um, yeah, notice also how much. In being in touch with uh, the sentiment of the Warren, Hazel is also being in touch with um, rabbitry as a whole. I mean, look at the principles here, right? Um, he recognizes their fear, right? The first factor, they're afraid of the unknown and what is to come because it's dangerous. Um, uh, but uh, they have a longing for the does, right? They want to continue their warren. They want to get mates. Um, they have a, this sense of mischief, this desire to trespass and steal. Um, their curiosity, right? All of these, you know, these are all very Elahrera like things. As Curita says, he's appealing to their higher nature as rabbits. Um, yes, yes. Um, exactly. Um, 
Yeah, Kate says it reminds her of the time when uh, Bigwig forcibly chastised the recalcitrant rabbits early on when Hazel would rather have persuaded them. Um, yeah, and not only saying I would rather have persuaded them, but Hazel saying there was no need to do that. They could have been made to see this. I want them to follow me because they see it's the only thing to do, right? Um, uh, it's not just that he wants people to buy in with his plan. He wants people to see that this is... You know, he wants it to be everybody's plan, right? He wants it to be everybody's conviction. Um, uh, Wound Ward is very different. Um, starting to talk about Ephrapha and the descriptions of Ephrapha we get, I was really struck by this parallel, and I want, I want to see what you think of it. Here's the beginning of the book, in, in, the, in the beginning of chapter one. The May sunset was red in clouds, and there was still half an hour to twilight. The dry slope was dotted with rabbits, some nibbling at the thin grass near their holes, others pushing further down to look for dandelions or perhaps a cowslip that the rest had missed. Here and there one sat upright on an ant heap and looked about, with ears erect and nose in the wind, but a blackbird, singing undisturbed on the outskirts of the wood, showed that there was nothing alarming there, and in the other direction, along the brook, all was plain to be seen, empty and quiet. The warren was at peace. This is Sandalford Warren in Chapter 1. Our first glimpse, our first description of normal, happy, rabbit, warren life, right? The warren was at peace. Here's our description of Ephrapha, which is also at peace. Dusk was falling on Ephrapha. In the failing light, General Woundwart was watching the near hindmark at Silflay, along the edge of the great pasture field that lay between the warren and the iron road. Now, what I'm going to ask you is, compare and contrast, so you can start making observations as I read. Most of the rabbits were feeding near the mark holes, which were close beside the field, concealed among the trees and undergrowth, bordering a lonely bridle path. A few, however, had ventured out into the field, to browse and play in the last of the sun. Further out still were the sentries of the Ausla, on the alert for the approach of men, or Elil, and also for any rabbit who might stray too far to be able to get underground quickly, if there should be an alarm. Okay, what do you notice? We get the warren at sunset, rabbits grazing, peaceful surroundings. Yes, Nancy, it's true that the warren is at peace at Sandalford right before it's violently destroyed. I know, I know. Uh, but the fact that the peace is destined to end soon doesn't make the peace any less. T I mean, it was a genuinely peaceful place uh, before the bulldozers got there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. What do you notice? Compare and contrast the two warrens. What do we, what do we learn about Ephrapha from this initial glimpse? One of the things that I'm trying, the, 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 the broader thing I'm trying to get at here is I want to avoid doing two things. One thing I want to avoid. It's easy to start talking about Ephrapha in general, and General Woundwort in particular, um, in simply in human terms. That is, sort of comparing them to totalitarian societies and stuff. I'm not, a, I'm not against using that word, um, but, but I think we have to be careful. Because, um, again, it's not, this is not just a human society, right? It's tempting. We might, perhaps, when we meet Eph Ephrapha, when we meet Ephrapha, feel a new onset of a, of the temptation to depart that secondary world and in imaginative investment that I've been talking about for weeks, the way in which this book has sort of trained us to look at this story not from a human point of view and, and sort of just thinking about humans all this time as if this whole story is really just about people dressed up as rabbits, um, but really imaginatively to invest ourselves in a rabbit's view of the world. I think being introduced to Ephrapha um, might bring on a a return of that old... If we've conquered that temptation by this point, and I suspect if we haven't conquered that temptation, we probably will have stopped reading by now. But anyway, um, uh, it, it might bring on a, a, a relapse of that temptation. And I think we have to be careful with it. So um, I don't want to just talk about Ephrapha 
as if it were a human society dressed up as rabbits. It's not. I want to be thinking about Ephrapha in connection with the rabbit societies that we've been seeing. Taking Bigwig and Hazel on the one hand and General Woonwart on the other hand. Um, looking at this, the Ephrafin Society compared to the Sandalford Society, compared to um, the Watership Down Society. Um, so that's the one. That's that's one thing that I want to avoid. I've forgotten the other thing. There was a second thing. Okay, so there were two things I want to be careful of. One is reading it like humans. Um, well, and I think the other is just simply being. Um, being too dismissive. That is, it's easy to say, well, you know, B- B- Woonwort is a bully and a tyrant, um, you know, and Hazel is not. Um, well, yeah, but, like, in what ways? is he, I, That is to say, I think that Woonwort is a much more interesting character than simply, um, you know, a completely... Uh, you know, evil inversion of everything that is good and pure and holy about rabbits. Um, so, um, so I want to be that. Yeah, that was definitely the second thing. Not to just be dismissive in that way. I want to look closely at Ephrafa and perceive sort of its strengths as well as its weakness. Um, anyway, okay. Um, back to the observations that you guys were making. Um, Gerald Michael says, we have the Warren at peace versus the Warren at hyper-watchful awareness. Um, yes, we have, of course, that one of the big issues that, that Holly brings up, right? He's the one who uses these terms. It's like you have security, but at what cost, right? Um, rabbits in Ephrafa are safe. They are as safe as rabbits could be. Notice this is the second time we have an almost completely safe set of rabbits, who are, because of their safety, living a life which is departing from rabbit culture, right? Cowslips Warren was completely safe, except for the wires, and Ephrafa is completely safe, except for Woundwort and his slave-driving Ausla. Um, other than that, it's perfectly safe, right? Um, remember the gifts of Elahera. Great Danger, remember, was one of those. Um, we talked about that last time, or time before last. Um, oh, it was last time. Good. Um, Michael Chiskowski goes so far, so far as to say that the peacefulness here is uh, an illusion. Um, and it's interesting, Michael, thinking of Nancy's objection. You could say the peace is an illusion in both cases. Right, um, but it's a different kind of illusion. Um, but anyway, um, yes, even the fact that we get those few rabbits who had ventured into the field to browse and play in the last of the sun—that's like the one normal moment, right? The one, uh, the one piece of sort of positive, healthy rabbit existence. But it's being done under the watchful eyes of the sentries who are looking, who are staying to make sure that no rabbit strays too far to be able to get underground quickly. But notice it's not just notice it, they're not just looking at them to like look for an excuse to beat them up or something. They're not simply uh, the the sentries the Ausla are not simply guilty of brutality, like arbitrary brutality. Or that wouldn't be the right word, right? Uh, brutality would be a compliment. It's like animality, isn't it? Never mind. You know what I mean. Um, arbitrary violence. Let me just put it that way. Um, there, I mean, there, the sentries are there to make sure that no rabbit strays too far to be able to get underground quickly if there should be an alarm. It's a good thing for their own safety, right? But you'll notice it's like they need babysitters for this, right? Um, that like it's that the Ephrafin, ab- the average Ephrafin rabbits are not capable of bolting for their holes successfully if a man or Elil were to come along. Um, that's kind of sad. right? Kind of sad in a s- very similar way to the rabbits in the Warren of the Snares. right? Uh, who don't know how to fight and just 
go straight out of their holes into the field without even looking around first, right? Um, they seem, and remember how hard it, the adjustment was for Strawberry, almost like the adjustment that the Hutch Rabbits make, right? Yeah, gosh, notice that's a trend with all of these non unnatural rabbit cultures, right? The Hutch Rabbits and the Warren of the Snares and Ephrathah. Safety is the thing that they, is the evil that they all have in common. You notice that? Um, yeah, good. Mark uh, makes the same observation very cogently. One group is watching out for themselves, the other group is being watched over. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Uh, Thomas Johnson makes a wonderful observation. There's an emphasis in the Sandalford description of how open the warren is. All was plain to be seen, empty and quiet. The description of Ephrathah focuses on the warren being concealed. Um, yes, yes. Um, and closed in, right? The rabbits are penned in by the ring of centuries. Um, uh, you know, so you have to get the open versus closed, the, um, uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, I know, that's good. That's good. Um, okay. Um, Michael Cheskowski was just making the Hutch Rabbit link. Um, yeah, see, it's a, the moral of the story is there's like no uh, observation I have to make about the book that somebody hasn't also made uh, in the comments. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let's move on to the description of Wound Wart. And I'll let you go soon. Maybe I should let you go now. If I should go, if I, hmm. yeah, let's do that next. Time. We'll, we'll, we'll. I don't want to short. I don't want to short change Woundwort, and we'll have lots more time to talk about him next time. Um, so let's do that. Let's. I, I'll, I'll save this. I wanted to talk about the description of Woundwort's arrival in Ephrathah and the way that he set up Ephrathah. Um But I don't want. I know if I move on to that now, I'm going to be constantly looking at the time and be in a really big rush. Um, so let's um, let's let's save that. We'll we'll save that for next time. We'll look at uh, Woundwort and his system in Ephrathah, and, and then of course we'll look at Bigwig's experience in Ephrathah. And as a couple of you were pointing out, that I didn't talk about it because it's not today's reading. Um, we will get some more poetry. Uh, so we we will get our third rabbit poet. Um, so uh, so I think that's I think that that's 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 kind of cool. Perhaps we will spend some time looking at uh, at the other rabbit poet. Um, the, I, want, I wanted to return to the announcement I declined to make at the beginning of class uh, before I let you go. And, and that is just uh, to point out um, next week is uh, the opening of the Hobbit movie. So um, I know that there will be a lot of people who will want to uh, talk about that. You know, we, last... The last two years, we've had Mythmoot on opening weekend of the film. Um, they saved opening... They pushed opening weekend so far back that it was, like, into uh, the holidays uh, um, this year, so we couldn't do that. Um, but <clears throat> we don't want to deprive you of the chance to... Uh, Unload in one way or another, and kind of debrief ourselves and uh, 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 and uh, and talk things over here. So um, we will uh, uh, we will we'll we'll definitely be doing that. I want to uh, just you know encourage everybody. You know we'll, we'll be um, I'll be having a couple uh, open sessions for us to get together and talk about it. Probably one right after the uh, the American. I know it's uh, it's already open in some places. Um, but uh, we'll have one right after the American opening, and then we'll have another one um, uh, uh, probably that weekend uh, as well, so that we can talk those over. So keep an eye out um, for those if you want to uh, if you want to if you want to talk about this stuff together. Uh, Karita says I make it sound like a support group. Uh, Kinda, you know. Uh, this I, I can't say there isn't that element, you know. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I certainly look forward to, uh, uh, to to talking it over with people. So we'll we'll sort that out. 
<clears throat> as we get into uh, as as we get into next week, and of course, this coming Friday, the day after tomorrow, um, we're having our final pre-film uh, riddles in the dark episode. So uh, do join us Friday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time for uh, for that. So anyway, thanks everybody for joining me tonight, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing the from here on the the last. You know the 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 readings for the for the next three classes are um, always the point where I like cannot stop reading this book. Uh, the story accelerates so fast after this um, that it's 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 going to be kind of hard to uh, um, stop. But uh, but anyway, um, so I'm really excited to 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 continue on. Um, some of my favorite parts uh, are in this next section. But anyway. Good night, everybody, and we will see you guys next week, and uh, uh, have a good evening. Good night.